Coming up today, we discuss NFL Week 4 results. C-Max the back, Bill Belichick sucks, and I love it. Also, in New York, you gotta love what Zach did. Also, gonna talk about the Damian Lillard trade. Holy what the buck, what the bucking hell. Where are they now in the entire NBA power rankings? It shouldn't surprise you, but I'll tell you anyways. And I got some funny videos. I got ladies loving, monkey loving, father-son loving. It's a lot of love out here, baby. It's a lot of love. What's up, everyone? It's another edition of Tricky Guy Sports. It's your host, Brent Bilski, a.k.a. Double B. What is up? All right, we will get into the big trade that happened over the weekend. What in the literal buck? Damian Lillard is in Milwaukee. That is just absolute insanity as far as the whole NBA goes. Milwaukee told everyone, including Miami, to go buck yourself. Everyone can eat shit. A big bag of shit. Oh, my God. That is bananas what just happened. So we'll break that down, what that means for the NBA and everything. I got some funny videos, as always, to react to at the end of the show. But let's kick things off with the NFL. Week four just came down. We still got Monday night. Well, by the time you will listen to this, we'll have Monday night done. But I really don't care about the Monday night games. If I'm being 100%. So let's get into what the three takeaways I got so far from week four in the NFL. We are finally entering the period of we're starting to figure these teams out and kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on. So let's go ahead and react to them. First things I noticed right off the bat in the 49ers 35 to 16 trouncing of a pretty decent Arizona Cardinals team is that Christian McCaffrey is that god dang dude, man. C Mac is back, pun intended. That running back out there in San Francisco is one bad boy, man. C Mac, I'm telling you, is one bad boy. McCaffrey, the swing to McCaffrey, oh. use check blocking out front. Oh, hurry. Leaping his way for the touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Sons of pros, man. I will continue to lecture you, sons of pros, but this dude is just going bananas. So he was already the number one rusher entering the into uh, this last week and then goes completely just insane. The dude has now 13 straight games with a touchdown, and in this game, not had one, not two, not three, a career-high four touchdowns. The prick had three by the end of the second quarter. I mean, it is just absolutely phenomenal. San Francisco, to me, is the king of the NFC so far. They are the story so far. I know we got the Cowboys. I'll get to them in just a little bit as they play each other next week. But, man, I'm telling you, this might be the first time since 2012, since a decade, where we might actually see a running back win the MVP as no quarterback has really kind of pushed themselves out there. Usually it's a quarterback's just trophy to win. This year we really haven't seen anyone really dominate that way on the quarterback level. And with McCaffrey doing what he's doing, again, it's not like San Francisco has not had a bunch of great players in their heyday and in their prime Christian McCaffrey now has the franchise record for most consecutive games with a touchdown he had four this last week he's the NFL's league leading rusher the dude can also catch out of the backfield San Francisco's 4-0 looks like they're going to be one of the top teams in the NFC barred an injury to Purdy or anybody else so the record's going to be there his numbers are going to be there you might see an MVP out of the running back situation for the first time in a decade since Adrian Peterson and well-deserved, man. I mean, I have always, you know, rooted for McCaffrey. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of the tribalism if I'm going to be 100% buck with you and just admit the fact that we just don't see white running backs ever, first of all, and one doing anything halfway decent is that catch-22, that Eminem effect of, like, you know, white people probably get too happy about it and uh, other people get a little too upset about it. Black people too happy, white people too mad. It just kind of is what it is. But, I mean, the dude is legit, man. I mean, how many years in a row now, with outside of injury, and miss me with the injury argument, by the way, of the Christian McCaffrey. I mean, every running back nowadays has injury issues. That's one of the reasons they're so hard to pay long-term. Just ask the Browns right now why they didn't pay Nick Chubb or Giants still kind of and going year to year with Saquon Barkley, the Dallas Cowboys getting rid of Ezekiel Elliott because of his. I'm just saying, and, and Elliott's not so much injury as just he costs too much. But I'm just saying, overall, it is a tough position to invest in long term because there's so many injuries. You also got Montgomery's been dealing with injuries this year. Uh, like I said, Chubb's knee snapped the wrong way. He's out for God knows how long. Saquon already had a high ankle sprain. It's not like he's the only running back because of the just stress and the amount of times they touch the ball in a game that running backs are not 
not usually someone who, you know, goes a whole season without having being dinged up or whatever. So, I mean, yes, he's had some injuries. He, you know, the trade from Carolina and everything else, it took him, a, you know, he, get, he was moved mid-season. It took a minute to kind of get him adjusted to the San Francisco system. But now the full offseason and with looking healthy as can be and having the, you know, protege, you know, coming from the son of pro athletes and just the, the skill set and just everything put together, Christian McCaffrey is that dude, man. Go ahead and everybody that picked him this year in fantasy number one overall, go ahead and uh, flex yourself a little bit because that was the smart move. This dude is just on fire and looks like he's not going to stop anytime soon. All right, other thing I noticed by the NFL Week 4 reactions here, I love watching Bill Belichick eat it. I love it. I, I know there might, I mean, I don't think outside of New England there's anyone who's not in my camp. But, I mean, watching Bill Belichick get his ass kicked by the Dallas Cowboys was truly entertaining. Was truly entertaining. I mean, look, I know I have the Texas here on my hat, and I am a Texas boy, but I am not a Cowboys fan. I am Cowboys neutral. I really don't love or hate them. One of the few people in Texas, especially as a sports broadcaster, who just, you know, I can take or leave the Cowboys. They're good for ratings. They're good for attention and everything else. And they are, underneath San Francisco and Philadelphia to me, the best teams in the NFC. But I still want to focus more on the AFC here because watching Bill Belichick and his team suck out loud is fun for me. I, I enjoy this. I, I don't like Bill Belichick. I've never liked him from day one. I, you know, not being the biggest Tom Brady fan, I still, if I'm cho if I'm forced to, you know, choose a side between those two camps, I was very much Team Brady. I thought Bill Belichick and his ego and his almost necessity a la like Jerry Jones when he didn't want to, you know, keep Jimmy Johnson or Parcells. This ego that some of these just megalomaniacs get of this idea that even though he didn't win before him in Cleveland and, you know, was really a fledgling coach, the 20 years of success, the unprecedented Super Bowl appearances, runs, wins, record-setting, just franchise, absolute, all-time one of the greatest franchises of all time, and to just be so seemingly eager he seemed always eager to try to prove that life without Tom Brady was going to be easy. And uh, how'd that work out for you, Billy? Huh? Crying in your hoodie yet? You mumbling, incoherent, overrated pain in my... I've just... I'm, look, I'm not a Belichick guy. I've never been a fan of him. I don't like his personality. He and Popovich both. I don't like how they both act like talking to the media is like pulling teeth or something. And just this kind of, again... This Nick Saban-esque, this, um, this just ego. It's just you can tell Bill's massive ego is one of the main reasons Tom Brady did leave earlier than he should have out of New England. And so the irony of watching Dallas's defense just decimate Bill Belichick to the worst loss of his era in the 20 years as a New England Patriots head coach and to see it because of the quarterback play as much as I have no problems with Mac Jones and I have no ill will towards him just the irony the beautiful sweet irony that it's Mac Jones and his quarterback you know after all the just the seemingly just eagerness to push Brady out is the reason they are now one in three and sucked out loud and took a 38 to three ass kicking in front of everyone as the Dallas Cowboys defense just decimated them and to see him be a cranky little cranky pants in the middle of the third quarter as he had to take out Mac because of just the most piss poor play Mac Jones had the worst game of his career two pick sixes a fumble strip sack recovery for a touchdown played absolutely terrible you can see bill belichick crying in his little panties in this little highlight here oh bill belichick going to the bullpen here i know it's only baseball postseason so apropos mac jones is going to the bench he goes over and tells his quarterback and bailey zappy will get a chance he started a couple games and won them last year for this team and we'll see him yeah it's funny to me i find it funny it's actually i'm not even mad it's amazing. I think it's amazing that after all of the seemingly just desire to get rid of the greatest quarterback of all time and kind of seemingly, you know, wanting to prove to himself that he, I, I don't need uh, Tom Brady. He can say what he wants publicly. Everybody knows the story behind the scenes. To see that it's the quarterback issue that's the main thing happening to him in New England and why they might be arguably one of the worst teams in the entire league this year is hilarious. I enjoy it, and I have no sympathy for the Patriots fans. Bill Belichick as a head coach or anybody involved in that franchise currently, I, I find all that hilarious, so good for you. Dallas Cowboys, real quick. I Again, I am Cowboys neutral. I like having fun with y'all sometimes. 
Like a rhinestone cowboy. But I mean, underneath, again, San Francisco and Philadelphia, you guys are probably the best teams in the NFC and definitely have a Super Bowl chance this year. You got San Francisco next week, and I just want to point this out very, very quick. Great as your defense looks. Multiple takeaway touchdowns again in this last game. And Dak Prescott looking like he's coming back to form a little bit. McCarthy with the whole situation of, oh, I'm going to, you know, Kellen Moore and his offense was too much. You know, it was too, it wasn't really in my game plan. So I'm going to run the offense this year and I'm going to manage the ball better. Turnovers have gone way down. You look great. You absolutely look phenomenal over there against New England. But this is still a glaring stat. The Dallas Cowboys, for the last three games in the red zone, are 4 of 15. I'm going to give you that one more time just so that go ahead and just you can settle that in. They were 4 of 15 the last three games in the red zone. That is absolutely not just inefficient. That is sucking out loud. So if you want to be a Super Bowl contender and you get down to that 20-yard line, you got to be able to punch it in. I mean, you got Prescott, you got Lamb, you got Pollard, you know, you got some good offensive linemen there. There is no excuse other than there is just a little bit of the yips or I don't know, something going on out there in Dallas. And San Francisco is no joke. And your defense is going to struggle against Purdy and McCaffrey. You're not going to hold them to three points, ten points or something small. Your offense is going to have to execute in the red zone. And 4-15, and oh, by the way, against the Jets, who have a good defense, but not a great team, the Jets, the Cardinals, and the New England Patriots to be 4-15 in the red zone is not just embarrassing, it's alarming. For a team that wants to win the whole thing this year, which is obviously your goal, that is not going to get it done. And if you do that type of level of uh, efficiency against a San Francisco 49ers team, you're going to get your ass kicked again by them as you have the last couple years in the playoffs. So Dallas Cowboys, good luck with that. Good luck with that game. I am definitely going to be tuned in. But 415 isn't getting it done. However, I do appreciate 38 to 3 trouncing Bill Belichick, the worst loss in his entire coaching career as a New England Patriots head coach. That was hilarious. And Bill, I got one here for you. And go ahead and let Tom know how he's doing. Maybe FaceTime him and beg him to come back. A little bit too late for that, isn't it? It is not too late for the new uh New York Jets. I I know they have gone through a tough time in the you know beginning of the season and the poor Jets. I mean, look, they they have continued sad sad music for the for the Jets. You know, the, the fan base even highlighted last night. The guy had the just endure the suffering for the Jets anagram, whatever you want to call it. It is a tough organization to be loyal to, and Jets fans are still loyal because they just are. But they do have a bitter kind of, you know, cynical attitude, and rightfully so. I mean, the few times you've had even blinks of maybe getting out of the, you know, little little brother syndrome to the New York Giants or just looking like one of the best teams in the AFC. Something always bad happens. It is Murphy's Law incarnate out there in New York. So all that being said, though, I do want to say this. I thought Zach Wilson, after, of course, losing Aaron Rodgers, he's, and he's gone for the season. Can we, can we stop that, by the way? Can we stop this Aaron Rodgers nonsense? I'm going to come back after an Achilles tear, you know, with uh, midway through the season or the end of the season or whatever. Yeah, and I'm going to go on to win MVP in the NBA this year. Calm down, Chief. But Zach Wilson is a number two overall pick and does have talent. And I thought last night, and it was definitely more of a Zach to remember, pun intended. You know, the Taylor Swift being in the audience. I'll get to that nonsense here in a second. But, I mean, Zach Wilson, with his career on the line, season on the line, I know a moral victory is very in line with New York Jets of like, yeah, big effing deal. We got a moral victory. But, I mean, he finally, for the first time, I think got the team to believe in him. And I've always said that is a quarterback's job before anything else. A quarterback in the NFL, your number one job is to make everyone else believe if I do my job, he'll do his. And that's it. I mean, being able to, you know, get five touchdowns a la Josh Allen versus Miami or something is phenomenal. But in the end, your main goal as a quarterback is to make everyone else in the stadium and in that, you know, sideline and on your bench go, if we do our job, he'll do his. And at least for three and a half quarters after a bad start in Kansas City, Zach Wilson did exactly that. The dude actually outplayed Patrick Mahomes. Did you know that? For the first time in Patrick Mahomes' career, 
he was outplayed, and it was by Zach freaking Wilson. Let me go ahead and put this stat up real quick so you can go ahead and see it. Um, Zach Wilson is the first opposing quarterback to outperform Patrick Mahomes in college or in the NFL. He was the only quarterback to ever have fewer interceptions, more completions, passing yards, and touchdown passes in a games in a Patrick Mahomes start in both NCAA and NFL. That is absolutely phenomenal. What does that do? Does that blow your mind? And I know you didn't win the game. I know you did not win the game, and that sucks. But, I mean, you know, there was a couple things there to discuss. But, I mean, Zach looked great. He he showed touch. He was just whipping the ball out, one, two reads. The offense got a little bit more, uh, you know, creative there and using and highlighting what he does rather than just hoping he'll become Aaron Rodgers. And he looked good, man. He was, he was you know, marching down the field. Yeah. Right there, hide the ball. You got time. And now drop that one right over the top. He's starting to get a feel. He was. He got a feel for the game last night. And I know everyone wants to talk about two things about this game. They want to talk about the Travis and Taylor thing, which we have to, unfortunately, for at least half a second. But we also do need to discuss the holding penalty from hell. And yes, I, if you guys missed this, how on a third and 22, other than doing, you know, people with the, the NFL scripted or they didn't want, you know, the Chiefs to lose with Taylor up there in the stands and the whole thing, or just Jets cynicism, whatever. This was absolute horseshit. I mean, I don't know how this call doesn't happen. It's a third and long. The Jets have finally got the momentum completely swinging their way it's third and 22 and i mean johnson just i mean did everything besides pull this guy's pants down and I, this this is this is bad I, this was really was pretty pretty crushed now not just questionable this was crazy this was absolutely nuts look at this look at this look at this here look at this here look at that again look at that again <laughs> look at that again <laughs> Number 11, just begging for a call. I mean, good God. <laughs> and then Mahomes runs for like 25 yards and gets this miracle first down. I mean, it was absolute nonsense. I'm with you on this. I am absolutely with you that that was absolute bull crap, and you guys deserve better out there in New York, and you should be 2-2. Two and two. But in the end, I just want y'all to focus on the main thing that's important here. Zach Wilson had his season and career on the line. You were against the defending Super Bowl champs and you got down 17 to nothing, almost in a blink. And rather than quit, and rather than just show and just roll over and show your belly, he showed fight. He got the team to believe. The defense played phenomenal once again. Sauce Gardner also got a horseshit holding call, that uh, defensive holding on another third and long that shouldn't have happened either. And yes, you lost the game. Yes, moral victory suck, especially to a Jets organization and fan base who's tired of hearing about, oh, you know, we're doing better or moral victories and all that other stuff. But the fact is, for the first time since Aaron Rodgers walked in that building, another quarterback got them to believe that they can win the game and not just win a game, win against the defending Super Bowl champions and, and gave a hell of an effort. And after the game, after the fumble and everything else, Zach Wilson was taking it on himself and saying out loud, you could see on the sidelines, I lost the game, it's my fault. And, I mean, lo and behold, his other teammates are coming up, the wide receivers, linemen, they're consoling him. Zach is getting the team to believe in him for the first time since he's walked in that building as the number two pick. That is a huge deal. You are one in three. It's a long season, New York. And for the first time since A-Rod went down with that Achilles injury, in my opinion, this little BYU number two bust Joe Namath hates pick you had here showed everyone and beat Patrick Mahomes, outplayed Mahomes for the first time in Mahomes' career in both college and NFL and showed y'all you have someone that at least can get you maybe not all the way to the promised land, but can get you a lot farther than you expected. Your season is not over and I'm rooting for you out there in New York. I understand there's a reason to be cynical. You have every right to be cynical. And, you know, it is what it is. But still, good luck to you guys, and way to go, Zach. I thought you did a phenomenal just uh, performance there with everything on the line, showing some balls, showing some gumption, and giving New York at least something to root about, especially 
with the damn Taylor Swift thing in the crowd. Let, let me just address this nonsense real quick. Because, look, I, like a lot of people, am already over it. I am over the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey storyline, relationship. NBC just went just, I mean, full spectacle nonsense putting, you know, and showing Taylor every 37 seconds out there in the crowd. I You know, this is unfortunately part, though, of what they got to do. And I'll explain why they are leaning into this so hard in a second because Taylor Taylor was once again at the game. Here's Taylor Swift and the VIPs yeah. who are here watching a little closer game here tonight. You know, uh, Mama was around there somewhere. There was other celebrities around there somewhere. And I, and I get it. They went to her 187 times. They talked about her in the pregame and then the postgame. It was all over all the social media stuff. And I know you, like myself, and a lot of other people could care less. I, I don't care. They're a business. The NFL care. is a business. I don't, he does not care. And even though I we don't, don't care, care, a lot I, of people do. The uh, the argument of who is chasing whose clout, I mean, look, while Travis Kelsey was already a Hall of Fame, you know, first ballot Hall of Famer, you know, had his own reality shows, has a podcast, everything else, he is a very famous athlete. In the battle of who has more clout, it is not even close between Travis or Taylor here. You know, is there there's been a lot of little videos going back and forth of boyfriends and girlfriends annoying each other, saying that one is dating the other one to try to go ahead and blow up and get more famous. I will not even try to make the argument that Travis Kelsey is more famous than Taylor Swift in any way, shape, or form, because Taylor Swift has a cult-like, psychotic following that is something I have very rarely ever seen, especially this sustainable level. Everyone has their flash-in-the-pan moment where they suddenly become a big deal. Taylor has held on to it like she has sold not just her soul but everyone behind her her firstborn and then on souls because dude she has people Swifties are not just into her they will defend her to the very end they will also support her to the very end they will buy her tickets they will do her things her movies already going to set record breaking numbers her concert went so bananas it made even Michael Jackson's concerts look small I mean she is on another level of fame attention and unfortunately that brings eyeballs that brings ratings and that brings her Swifty crowd which is not the normal NFL thing. The fact is, dude, Taylor's got that effect. Even just last night, just so you know, in the Chiefs Jets game last night, the television ratings were up 34% uh, versus the last week. That is a third increase by just having her in the flipping stands. I mean, the fact is, if you look at the overall effect of the, you know, just the previous time when she showed up, I mean, this is absolutely when she went to the, the Bears game. A 400% spike in Travis Kelsey jersey sales. That's just one. Uh, so they also have a new record of um, the uh, the custom jerseys because they're putting Swifty with the 87 out there. His podcast, Travis Kelsey's podcast and his brothers, which is good, but it's not the most amazing thing ever, is now number one overall on Apple. He got 400,000 followers just after the day after the game, and I think he's gotten even more since then. Uh, 24 million viewers was the number one game watched this week. Again, Sunday Night Football was also up 34% in ratings and also the number one game watched on Sunday night. Uh, there was a 63% jump in female viewers ages, uh, ages 18 to 49. Three times increase in Chiefs searches on the web. Three times increase on Chiefs sales on StubHub. And the Chiefs sold more tickets in a single day since the start of the season because that cult leader over there, and I mean that's almost what she is at this point, brings all the attention I balls on the planet in the world it is what it is we're not all a huge fan of it i get it but the fact is this is something until they break up that is going to continue to be a just eye-rolling nauseating storyline that is going to continue to roll and i mean look it, it, i don't want to get into this whole silly argument here but the fact is taylor is more famous than travis and if anyone is chasing clout or chasing fame you unfortunately got to go and say it's it's got to be travis i, I mean and it, look don't put it past him the guy did have a reality dating show he does like you know kind of being the center of attention a little bit he probably has little brother syndrome a little bit because patrick mahomes is the steph curry of the nfl there's a whole lot of stuff going on there but in case you wonder why do people talk about it why is the nfl so focused on it because unfortunately that little lady is is just beyond attention grabbing that is like Barack Obama, Michael Jackson, and I don't know, Mike Tyson combined as far as like just everyone just, oh my God, oh my God, Taylor, Taylor's in the crowd. Oh my God, Taylor, 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 Taylor was riding in the car with him. Taylor, you know, I saw Travis, uh, there was a photo of him leaving her apartment. I mean, I mean, I mean, two adults having sex, that's crazy. I mean, it's, it's just what it is. It is what it is. I know you don't care. I don't care either. So let's move on. Um, I want to go to the NBA. 
I want to go to the National Basketball Association. Again, Milwaukee Bucks just told everyone to eat it. Everyone can eat shit. A big bag of shit. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm the greatest man in the world. That, that's, that's bananas. Damian Lillard to Miami was not even a consider, or excuse me, Milwaukee. That's how much, you see Freudian slip there? That's how bad and how much everyone thought it was going to happen that Damian Lillard was going to be a Miami Heat or maybe a Brooklyn Net or a New York Knicks or something. Nobody, and I mean nobody, was saying, oh, he's going to Milwaukee. And lo and behold, that is what happened. And oh my God, if you don't think that is now, and Vegas has already agreed, vaulted them to the number one spot in the National Basketball Association for next year as the favorites to win, you again are not paying attention. This is Damian Game Time Lillard. I don't know how many times I have to explain this to you, that Damian's not just some guy. The dude just dropped 70 last season. This dude is an absolute beast. And yes, in case you missed and didn't follow the whole thing, I mean, this is... This is crazy. This guy's only 33 years old, and Giannis made it clear. If you do not get me some more help and you do not show me that you want to invest in me long-term in the future, I will be gone in 2025. Milwaukee did not just go out of their way to prove a point to try to keep Giannis. They have gone all in bringing this guy as, as an absolute miracle to this team and pairing him now with Giannis Antetokounmpo. This is just, besides being able to keep Brooke Lopez, besides having the shooters and everything else around them, losing Drew Holiday hurts. I understand that. But you're replacing him with that guy. That's Damian Lillard. This is not just some dude, man. Damian Lillard is arguably not just a top 10, but after this season, and once they start running that pick and roll, when this guy starts running the pick and roll with the Addis Ada de Kumpo, good freaking luck. Damian Lillard was not, you know, uh, just a decent pick and roll player. He was only number two in points per play and points per possession in running pick and roll execution to Luka Doncic. That's it. There was nobody else in the league that had better statistical numbers at 1.16 points per possession when they run the pick and roll than uh, Luka Doncic. The only one behind him and it was Damian Lillard. Uh, Damian Lillard is that good. And he's that good off the dribble. He might be the best scorer off the dribble in the entire league now that Kyrie's kind of, you know, doing whatever. But, I mean, when it comes to just being able to create his own shot, to create clutch shots at the end of the game, something Giannis is, you know, okay at but not great, I, I can't think of, like, other than, like, a Kobe Shaq kind of pairing of just, like, damn. It's not like Damian can't play defense if he doesn't want to. In the playoffs, if he wants to buckle down, Damian can do it. And offensively, I mean, there's nights I think he's way better than even Steph Curry as far as, like, the most creative, being able to score in every single way because Damian also is that shifty, Chris Paul-like skill set where he can get to the free throw line a bunch. He can get your guys in foul trouble. He can frustrate you. He, of course, can go off. I mean, again, the dude dropped 70 just last season. And that's with him being, you know, just kind of not even into the season and kind of a malcontent. Now, he gets to go out and be not just part of a good team, but the number one favorite in the entire National Basketball Association, and rightfully so, because this is just going to be almost a cheat code. When you consider who else is around them, too, I mean, with uh, Connaughton, Beasley, Middleton, Lopez... Dude, this is not just some small thing. The NBA is shifted forever. For the next few years, Milwaukee Bucks, short of a major injury or something crazy happening, have to be your favorite. They have to be. I, I, I don't know. They were already good before with just Drew Holiday and everybody else. They added Damian Lillard. They did not just add anyone. They added that guy. That's crazy. That's crazy talk. They did go all in. The next seven years, just so you know, the Milwaukee Bucks... This is how much they believe in it, and I believe in it too. The Milwaukee Bucks do not control their first-round draft picks now for the next seven years. They traded away three and traded the swap rights to four. They have foregone the next seven years saying, damn it, that's Damian. That's Dame time. We get to have him with Giannis. We're not screwing this up. And so, you know, in the end, if you didn't, you know, hear on all the details, and shout out to Portland, I will say, Look, uh, sad as I feel for Jimmy Butler here, and Jimmy Butler, this was a great meme. This was actually him supposed to be talking about gas prices, but somebody else threw this out there. He did accuse the league of tampering, so it's not like this video is that far off. But let me go ahead. Where do I have it? Oh, here we go. Uh, Jimmy Butler. This is high-rate f***ing robbery. This came out hours after. Man. The I mean, look, I feel bad for Jimmy. I feel bad for Miami. It's a sad situation. But in the end, Portland... You got to give them their credit. I mean, give them their credit. They got everything they wanted. Real man of genius. 
as much as I was bitching, everyone was bitching, make the trade. You're not going to get a better offer. Portland and, and Cronin and crew can go ahead and pat themselves on the back because they didn't just get what they wanted. They got everything they wanted. Everything. Everything. Uh, what, 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 if you're a Portland fan for trading away one 33-year-old point guard who was not going to be able to help Scoot Henderson and the kids go into the future, to trade away one guy and to get DeAndre Ayton, uh, Brogdon now, who you could possibly still do in another trade and even get more assets or keep him as a veteran leader for Sharp and Simons and Scoot and everybody else and still have a good year this year. To make your center spot, which used to be a weakness and now make it a strength because you didn't just add DeAndre Ayton, you also added Robert Williams. Williams a third and did not get just one pick, not two picks, but three first round picks and two swap rights. So for one 33 year old point guard, who is the greatest point guard in Portland's history is the best player in Portland's history and was a tough guy to see go for you to be able to return that with not one pick, not two picks, but three first round picks and then two swap right picks also for first round. Then to add a young Deandre Ayton, then to add another Robin or uh, Robert Williams, then to also add uh Brogdon who you can once again trade for more assets or use as a veteran leader that is well done i i mean well done i i really don't know what else you can say there except portland did their thing thing so everything now dust settling and all that what does this mean for the rest of the league um again if you look at what milwaukee's doing this is this is crazy this is absolutely crazy. And yes, also Boston traded for Drew Holiday. You know, Drew, this is so crazy. Drew goes from Milwaukee, you know, having that for being a, a great player for them, and it was sad to see him go. He goes to Portland for like half a second. Then he gets traded to Boston, the other, the other team in the East that can actually be a threat to the Milwaukee Bucks. But just to give you one more time, to, I'm just going to reemphasize this. It's Damian Lillard and Giannis Antetokounmpo both in their prime. I mean, these, these are not just two guys. As this little thing points out, 63.3 points per game combined last year, average scoring. These two by themselves, just scoring the ball, average 63 points per game. It is the first time two players have averaged 30 and up and have then teamed up the next season. We have never seen an NBA history where two players the year prior averaged both 30 points a game, then team up the next year. And it's not like they both got you know thrown to some little scrub or expansion or some little basic team that still doesn't have a lot of hope. He gets to join a team that was already, in my opinion, the best team last year. They just had a Giannis injury and a coach having his brother die situation to where that was what really affected them and losing to a Miami Heat who ended up being the best eight seed arguably in NBA history when you consider the run that they went on afterwards. So it's not like Damian and Giannis as both 30-point scorers last season for the first time ever had to team up with a bunch of scrubs. They get to team up with a team that now has combined along with Damian and Giannis. Again, Pat Connaughton, Beasley at the two guard. You have Chris Middleton coming off another offseason hopefully to get healthy. He's an all-star. Jay Crowder has been a great veteran. Uh, just by himself. Brooke Lopez has not just proven to be one of the best shooting centers we've ever seen ever in the history of ever from the three-point line. He's also an unbelievable defensive player. He's now got his twin brother out there. Giannis also has his brothers back on the bench there, too. It's brotherly love. It's it's defense. It's shooting. It's closers. It's MVPs. It's guys in their prime. I mean, fear the freaking deer. If you do not believe in the Milwaukee Bucks right now, you just either don't like them or you just don't watch the NBA much in a small market Milwaukee just never really got your attention. That's bananas. That That's bananas. Like, I, I'll keep saying this. They told everyone else to go buck yourself. Everyone can eat shit. A big bag of shit. Milwaukee Bucks are the best team in the league. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's no argument for me, really, if you just go by on paper. I don't know what they're missing. I, you tell me. You tell me what they're missing. I'll wait. I'll wait. You tell me what the Milwaukee Bucks currently are missing other than, I mean, I don't know, an all-star two guard? I mean, they have arguably all stars in almost every other position. It's it's insane. It's insane. Um, but again, shout out to Portland, Portland Trailblazers. Also, the, the that haul you got for the one player again in DeAndre Ayton, Brogdon, uh, Williams, the three first rounders, two pick swap rights as well is is a great amount of moves there. I'm very sorry to Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat because you guys have fallen off the map for me as anybody who can even be considered a contender. No offense. 
I, I don't see it. You lost Vincent. Um, we'll see Hero now. We'll see how he does. He's going to be either very motivated this year or going to be very much a malcontent after clearly being the thing that they dangled, the carrot that they tried to dangle in front of Cronin and the Trailblazers. They tried their balls off to get that trade done and weren't able to do it. So, I, unfortunately, Miami, I, I, I can't give you all another chance at a run this year because it's the Milwaukee Bucks one. And let me go ahead and give you this. I'm just – let me go – I'm, I'm segueing quickly here. But I'm going to give you now my top six NBA teams as of these latest trades, Drew to Boston, Damian to Milwaukee. But, you know, without question to me, uh, other than they just haven't played together yet, and we do have a few unanswered questions. But on paper, if you do not think that a pick and roll with Giannis and Damian Lillard being run to the efficiency that they can run it on, surrounded by shooters like Connaughton, Beasley, Lopez, Portis can shoot the ball, Chris Middleton's one of the best shooters in the league, you know, everything combined, dude, the Milwaukee Bucks, they have the size, they have the defense, they have the bench. They, they, they're they good, man. It's quite a load. Quite a load. Well, Ben can handle quite a load. So, who do I have at second? That's a great question, and I'll answer it now. Denver Nuggets. I, look, they, they still are the defending champions. So, I'll give you my top six right now of NBA teams after all the dust has settled from the offseason. Who do I think the top six teams in the NBA are? I'll give them to you right now. As I said, first of all, Milwaukee Bucks are clearly number one for me. But how is number two not the Denver Nuggets? I, how? I, I mean, they were they not just the defending champs who ran through the NBA last year? <laughs> Were they not the number one seed from the beginning? Did they not go 16-4 in the playoffs? The only team to have a better and easier run in the playoffs in a 20-game playoff format was the Golden State Warriors that used to have KD, Steph, and and uh, uh, Clay Thompson. That's the only team that had a, a easier run through the 20 uh, through a 16, and they went one. The uh, Denver Nuggets went 16-4. So they're the second best team ever to just ransack the rest of the league as on their way to the NBA Finals. They returned everyone. I, you tell me. You you tell me why they shouldn't be the number two seed. Other than again, small market team. Maybe you know Jokic still confuses you because he's this big, slow, goofy, white, just Serbian, just uh, duh, duh. Cause white. Because he's white. Because he is white. Look at him, man. What you gonna Maybe you still don't respect Jamal Murray after the unbelievable run that he had. As those two once again showed what a one-two punch, big and small, can do when they both are put together and are motivated. So that's why I have Milwaukee above them. But I mean, once. Again, Again, Jamal Murray and, and, and Nikola Jokic just dominated the entire playoffs. They were 16 and 4. They, they're this, they had the second easiest run ever in NBA recorded history, other than the Warriors that were, you know, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Klay Thompson. Um, they brought back everyone of note. I mean, I know they lost, uh, you know, a couple small guys here, but they still got Murray. They still got KCP. They still got Michael Porter Jr. They still got Aaron Jordan. They still got Nicole Jokic. They still got Reggie Jackson. They still got the Brown kid. Um, I mean, DeAndre Jordan and the Naji, they got size. They got the experience. I mean, the uh, championship hangover, you, you can make that argument, I guess. You could say that, you know, it's hard for teams to repeat because it's hard to come with that same fire and determination where last year, uh, myself included, nobody really expected them to win the whole thing. And they had that, you know, extra chip on their shoulder. And now the chip is sitting currently in their living room. And uh, I don't know. I mean, other than that, I really don't see how you can argue the Denver Nuggets aren't the second best team in the league. So I got Denver at two. So Milwaukee won, Denver two. Now I got Boston at three. I got Boston at three because... I mean, look, you guys have had opportunities to prove that you are ready to take that next step with the Tatum-Brown combination, and one of them always seems to let you down, usually Jason Tatum. I, you know, this is – you got. I got to go with your top guys. In Milwaukee, yes, it was at Portland, but I've seen Damian show up and eliminate not one but two teams at the very last second, eliminating shots. He's the only guy in NBA history to eliminate two teams in the playoffs with buzzer beaters. Giannis has won an NBA title, so I got to put them above your guys. Then I look at, again, the Denver Nuggets. Nikola Jokic and Murray just won the title last year in dominating fashion. I can't put you above them after what they just did when they returned everybody. And when I look at the Boston Celtics – on paper, you're arguably the best team overall, bench included. Well, you're a little bit top-heavy now, aren't you, with all the trades? But you do have a top six that is absolutely bananas. I mean, you look at uh, now Drew Holiday, which I think was a smart 
you know, uh, switch out there for Marcus out there to somehow be able to bring Drew Holiday into the mix instead of Marcus Smart, who for all of his things is offensively sometimes a liability and a little bit of a head case. To look at your lineup now, Drew Holiday, uh, Brown, Tatum, Horford, and Chris Dapps Porzingis, who is going to ruin all of the old arguments of they were too small or didn't have enough scoring from the center position to be effective. If he stays healthy, that unicorn is ready to do some things. Had a great year out there in Washington. And then you also throw in Derek White, who seemed to make a just sudden just leap now that he's and he's also, by the way, shaved the nonsense off his head there, which is uh, about damn time. That was starting to get a little bit embarrassing, wasn't it? You will never find yeah. blom 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 a hairline like mine. Yeah, when all he saluted all the way back here, didn't he? I mean, but he shaved that off. He looks great. So again, Boston's uh, top six, while you might be a little top heavy, are Derek White, Drew Holiday, Brown, Tatum, Horford, and Porzingis. That is. Mm. That's a lot, man. If it wasn't for Milwaukee making the trade and Denver doing what they did last year, I would say this would be arguably one of the best combinations of a six core that we've seen in in multiple years, maybe since the Warriors and KD and Steph and Clay and all them. But uh, until you win something, I got I can't put you above the ones that have proven to me that they can win. So I got you guys at three. You do have some contract issues now. Uh, Drew Holiday is a one-year rental until you're able to extend him. He is going to want an extension at the end of the season, which unfortunately is going to coincide with Jalen Brown wanting the Supermax deal. So you're going to have a lot of money you're going to have to spend there and may not have enough now to spend it with all the new rules with the CBA. It's not like you can just throw away money like the Warriors and some of my teams I like did to where they were able to just kind Kind of once again, just you know, ignore the you know so called salary cap and do what they damn well pleased. Now you actually have to spend your money wisely, and it's going to be very interesting to see if you can keep everyone together following this season. But, money, money, but money, 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 money. you should be the title favorites other than the Milwaukee Bucks in the Eastern Conference this year, which unfortunately, number two is kind of where you've coincided and been in the last few seasons, hasn't it? Is so we'll continue to roll here in my with the dust settling. The top six NBA franchises, in my opinion, I got Milwaukee one, Denver two, Boston three. Phoenix is four because other than Kevin Durant, you have a bunch of unknowns as good and as just amazing as an offseason you guys had. Everyone loves to talk about the L.A. Lakers offseason, in my opinion. In my humble, smart, very well-educated, know-this-sport opinion, the Phoenix Suns offseason, especially when you think about the last two seasons combined, has to be the best job I've seen in a very long time of putting together not just now a top three that is absolutely a phenomenal, scary top three, but they were able to add all these little role players and all these bench guys that a lot of y'all probably just kind of didn't even pay attention to or kind of just barely blinked an eye at. They are now... They went from last year being just extremely top-heavy to just having really four good players and a bunch of guys that are kind of eh, to now being a complete team that is going to be a just a juggernaut. I I, got to put them underneath Denver as my favorites in the Western Conference because you just can't look at this lineup and not go, holy hell. Bradley Beal has been a consummate professional even on bad teams. So now with him having the first time in a long time to be on part of a winning team, I think you're going to see not just a good Bradley Beal, who's always been good, but you're going to see a motivated Bradley Beal. So when I look at a lineup that has Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and now you got a Koji, a Kogi, excuse me, and then Nurkic is a solid, at least scoring center versus an Aiton who, you know, could do things here and there but was inconsistent. Nurkic is a good overall center. But you look at their bench. And being able to add veterans that could really do and do the things that they need. Shooters like Aaron Gordon. Little prick shooters that I, unfortunately, tripping Grayson Allen, as much as I don't like him, is a great 3 and D bench guy off the bench. You look at guys like Yuta Watanabe, who a lot of y'all are going to learn about this year, who just had a explosive, he's like the Japanese Lamar Odom, but can shoot a little better. He's a phenomenal addition. Then they had Bowl as well. They got Bowl Bowl out there to play backup center. Uh, this is just, I mean, they're an unknown. But the Phoenix Suns, again, Beal and Gordon point guard, Booker Allen at the two, uh, two guard, Kevin Durant and Okogie at the three spot. Then you could maybe put, you know, Okogie at four, Yuta at four, we'll see. But then you got guys like Bowl Nurkic at center. This is a complete team that is no longer just reliance on Devin Booker and Durant having to come save the day. This is a now complete team that can really be 
not just a consistent winner in the regular season, but when you put Kevin Bradley and Devin out there in the playoffs with other guys out there who are not just good players, but they're role players and know their roles, but play them extremely well. Eric Gordon's always been a very good role player. You're going to learn about Utah this year. Allen has always been a very good, you know, as much as I don't like him, I think he sucks out loud as a human being, but as a basketball player is an excellent, just excellent pickup they got in that trade there. Nurkic will end up being a solid center as well. Phoenix is very good. We just don't know anything about them because they haven't been together ever. And uh, there's too many. Th- I got three teams above them that I think are more proven and have more of a uh, you know, proven commodity there. So I got Phoenix at four. The L.A. Lakers, I know everyone said, had the best offseason ever. And oh, my God. And a lot of this, I'm sorry, is the LeBron-loving hype of the Lakers train. But as I rank the teams and I put Milwaukee 1, Denver 2, Boston 3, Phoenix 4, the fact that you were kind of a surprise little run in the playoffs last year to now being, in my opinion, the fifth best team in the entire NBA on paper, and that's with some of the most dramatic seismic trades we've seen in a very long time in Milwaukee and Boston and Denver having the run they did last year. you got to give yourselves a lot of credit and have a lot of things to be excited for. I mean, the fact is, L.A. Lakers did have an amazing offseason, and their lineup now is not just big, is not just great defensively. They are huge, and they are very good defensively. It's not just like, oh, they got some size and they're good at defense. If they were able to put this together the way that they should, they are humongous and they are good on defense. This is a loaded squad here. And if you still consider LeBron the GOAT, there's no excuses. That is one thing I, mm, I swear to God, give me the truth right now. What the truth? You can't handle the truth. If you want to tell me with a straight face that you don't think this is LeBron's best chance in a while, and that he has no real excuses other than old age or just being disinterested or that, you know, some of the other team's trades were too unfair, whatever little bitching you want to do. But as far as on paper, LeBron James, if everyone stays healthy, and that is a big key, has every single thing that he needs to win in the Western Conference and to win an NBA championship. If Michael Jordan had this team or Larry Bird had this team, so many other teams, you know, legends that you, you know, you want to put him above or whoever else you want to put him above. I mean, just name them. Give a lot of other guys this team, and I'll show you an NBA champion. I mean, D'Angelo Russell is a very good borderline all-star point guard. Gabe Vincent, coming off finals experience, is an excellent shooter and unbelievable backup point guard. Austin Reeves just elevated to a whole nother level from this year to last. AR-15 is ready to roll. You picked up Cam Reddish, who has been, you know, kind of a disappointment a little bit, but talent-wise, and like at 6'8", 6'9", is a two-guard from hell, and you get to have him come off the bench and be a spark if that's what you want to do. Then you got LeBron James, a lot of people's argued GOAT, the greatest of all time at small forward. You got Prince behind him, who's a great 3 and D and just overall veteran good player there. Rui Achimura really showed a lot last year, especially in the playoffs, which is where things are going to count the most. That's an unbelievable guy to be able to put up the four spot, followed by Vanderbilt, who's this, you know, generation's like Dennis Rodman-like energy. Picture, picture like Rodman and Patrick Beverly if they had a baby there. Then you still have Anthony frickin' Davis. Then you pick up Christian Wood, who is arguably one of the best scorers in the entire league at the center position. And you got Jackson Hayes, another young, again, A.D., Wood, Hayes, Rui, Vanderbilt, James, Prince, Reddish. Those guys are all big and, and very versatile for their positions. I do not want to hear God dang stupid thing this year if you want to tell me with a straight face, well, you know, LeBron didn't win because he didn't have enough help. Kiss my ass. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He has everything he needs. Real quick, and I got to move on. Uh, So once again, my top six teams after all the trades, Milwaukee 1, Denver 2, Boston 3, Phoenix 4, LA 5. I will throw in, yes, I'm being a homer here. Yes, they are my team. But I do think the Golden State Warriors quietly had an unbelievable offseason and deserve a lot of credit and a lot of praise for what they did. This is not a team, in my opinion, that on paper is the number one by anybody's metric. But as someone who watches this team and knows that they do better in the strength by numbers and chemistry and the things with Jordan Poole and Draymond and the punch, yeah, with the, the new report said that you know we now know the quote from Jordan Poole, which is something like "You're an expensive bag at thirty million, 
and that's what led to the punch. Whatever the reason was, the season was never able to really get going. There was too much division between the young and the old, and there was too much separation. There was no team unity. The Warriors are truly, by their slogan, strength in numbers. They are a cohesive unit that revolves around a lot of free flow, a lot of, you know, it's just, it's that, whatever you want to call it, that cohesion they did not have last season. Adding Chris Paul sounds dangerous. I don't think it's dangerous at all. I thought it was freaking brilliant. I think Chris Paul, and yes, there's going to be, oh, is he coming off the bench? Is he coming off as a starter? He will finish most of the games, and he will be a big part of the organization and the rotation this year, and he is going to make the young guys, the Kamingas and Moody's, look so much better than they did with a Jordan Poole running around like a chicken with his head cut off. And once again, I look at this team, and they finally have the strength in numbers again. It's not even finally. They had it two years ago when they won. That's why I picked them at the time two years ago when I was arguing with people. I'm like, look, Warriors are good at you by attacking, by just strength and number and waves, and of course having head of the snake being Stephen Clay. But they are just a team that consistently just just keeps coming at you until you just absolutely break down because they are deep from start to finish. They are once again deep in that level from start to finish. When you look at Stephen Chris Paul at the point guard position, that is arguably the best one-two at the point guard spot ever in NBA history. Do you want to tell me they're not? Do you want to tell me that Steph Curry and Chris Paul as the starting and backup point guard are not the best combination ever in NBA history at the point guard spot? I would like to know who you got in front of them. I would really love to know that. Then you have Clay Thompson and Moses Moody, who did pick up and showed some a uh, little bit of spunk in the playoffs last year, Moody did. But they also have guys like Gary Payton II and Corey Joseph, who they picked up in the offseason, and also that Pazinski kid that they drafted. So at the two-guard spot, they got like five guys. And all led, of course, by Clay Thompson. But then they got four underneath who can all be excellent players in the right day and the right time. And none of them have the uh, pressure that you know a lot of other people would have because there's so many people they can put in that spot in that rotation era to just go with whoever's hot at the time. Then at the small forward spot, we got Andrew Wiggins with you know uh, fresh off season. Hopefully. Whatever happened to him doesn't happen again, and he'll get to play the full year out. A lot of people forgot how just absolutely phenomenal he was in the NBA playoffs. Then you got Kaminga, who I think is going to have a huge year. Thanks a lot to Chris Paul. Draymond's already hurt. Start the season off, whatever. I've never thought Draymond's that important. I am more excited by the guys that they picked up off the bench, guys like Jackson Davis at the end of the draft, who I think you guys are going to really you know learn a lot about here pretty soon. And then Saric. They picked up Dario Saric, who can shoot the three, is 6'10", and can at least guard the center spot with some level of efficiency behind Kevon Looney there. So, I mean, and also Rudy Gay, 37-year-old Rudy Gay they picked up, and he might be the last guy on the roster. That's a good team. When Rudy Gay, who's always been a very solid player, is the worst team, or the worst player, on you know, at the end of your roster, that's how solid the Warriors are this year. So you look at, again, Steph, CP3, Clay, Moody, Gary Payton, Corey Joseph, uh, Pazinski, you got Wiggins, Kaminga, Draymond, Saric, Looney, uh, Rudy Rudy Gay, this is a this is the teams that I like to watch out of Golden State. I still think they're too damn small. I'm never going to be able to get past that with Kerr. That ding dong is going to go ahead and just stick to that until he dies. Just ask the USA team this year who did not medal just how much Kerr loves small ball. <laughs> Because he just has to meddle with the just the basic understanding that seven footers are important when you're playing other seven footers. He will not do it again this year. Sarge is at least somewhat big. Jackson Davis, Kevon Looney are at least bigger than teams that they've had before. They are deep. Um, I, I still think that the chemistry issue thing with Draymond and Chris Paul and all that will be absolutely fine. Matter of fact, I think Chris Paul is going to be a consummate professional here and is looking for a ring. I, I really like Golden State. So once again, to review it all, at number one was Milwaukee. Number two was Denver. Number three was Boston. Number four, Phoenix Suns. Number five, LA Lakers. Number six, Golden State Warriors. Those are my top six teams now with all the trades and everything that's happened and uh, media day starting today. These are the six teams to me that you have to watch this year to go ahead and have a chance to win a championship. That's it. All right, good. Let me go ahead and have some fun here. It's time to get to one of my favorite parts of the show. Let's do these silly videos. You seen it? You seen it? Don't look at me. Don't look at me, little puppy. Have you seen this? Have you read about this? All right. Um, these are always fun, cringeworthy, somewhere in between. If you want to go ahead and enjoy this with us, it's on the YouTube channel in case you're listening to the audio. Please always Google Tricky Guy Sports and enjoy and ride along with everything that we're doing. Um, today's categories include kids, 
monkeys, ladies, and crying in baseball. Just going to leave it at that. Uh, we'll start off with kids. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them be funny at the catcher position. I mean, it's always, you know, cute to see kids in Little League having fun. They've added walk-up songs now to Little League, which I fully support. I am all for it. And I'll start off with an easy one here. Where is this kid? This kid's hilarious. Um, one of the kids walking up the bat, catcher had to join in. Got to join in sometimes on the music, especially if it's good stuff like Fitty. Gotta love it. Gotta love Little League. Gotta love kids just having fun. But that catcher is just living life the right way. Look at this kid go. What? Uh, uh. Go fat kid. Go fat kid. Go fat kid. It's cute. Um, what else do I got here? I have, oh, um, okay. I didn't even know this was a thing. I had no idea that they actually have organized and made it an event to where children speed walk, like seriously. Y'all seen the Chris Paul commercial, and it was supposed to be satire, supposed to be satirical, where Chris Paul's doing the speed walk competition. Uh, they apparently do this for real with children at real track sanctioned events, and it's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. In case you didn't see this, this is going around the interwebs here. Let me go ahead and find it. But yeah, this is a actual track event where kids speed walk, apparently for real, and it's freaking hilarious. Bam! Look at him go. No jogging allowed, man. Got to shake them hips. 100 to go. I mean, I guess you train for this, right? I mean, this is like, this is real deal. They got an announcer. Edwards doing his best. Uh-oh. Nesbitt now making a move. Making a move. Shorter and Graham battling for third. Work them hips, Without kid. Front, it's Edwards and Nesbitt. It's all in the hips, kid. Oh, he's getting beat. Caleb Nesbitt now taking the lead. Shooter Edwards <laughs> staying right down his tail. This is real. Here they come. They come around the stretch. Life of Pi here is not digging his life Hail right now. His shades are cool. And that kid. <laughs> the last 10 seconds of that, if you don't think, are some of the funniest things ever. Between this kid going like, ah, as he's trying to shake his little hippie hips there to go ahead and try to finish this thing. But the kid at the very end showing up. This is, I mean, this, I cannot believe this is real. Oh, no, I'm going to lose. I can't believe it. I've trained so hard for this. This is the worst thing ever. And it'll be what y'all doing? Y'all speed walking? <laughs> Got the head, man. Couldn't give a shit less. Uh, so that's real. Um, this is also real, and I can't believe it's real. This is, uh, I mean, tell me if this is fake. Because I have two videos. I have one kid being Spider-Man and one kid not being Superman. Apparently, this guy, he's not necessarily a kid, but he might be Spider-Man for real, and I cannot believe this is actual footage. Someone tell me if this is real footage or not. Look at this dude. That has to be CGI, right? That that that's got to be that that they're they're trying to tell me this is real. That has to be CGI. I mean, there's no way you have that level of precision. And how would you practice that? This has to be a joke. This can't be real. I don't believe it's real. I, 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 I'm i calling bullshit on that one. This next one, though, is real. And this kid is not Spider-Man. He is not Superman or nowhere in between. Thanks to his dad. He might not even be alive. Watch this. Ready? Ready? Go. And I'm dead. Oh! <laughs> the other video might not have been real. That was real. Air mattress just gone wrong there. Uh, that kid, if he's not Superman, he is a fly on the ceiling, not a fly on the wall. Ready? Holy crap. Set. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's okay, but God dang, that was crazy. Ready? Set. Go. I'm just going to keep doing it. It's not Spider-Man. It's not Spider-Man. <laughs> Moving on. Um, what else do I have here? Uh, ladies. Got to love the ladies. Everyone loves the ladies. I love the ladies. You love the ladies. We all love the ladies. Do I still have the res my engine? That's all right. I don't need it. Um, going to call this... 
we're going to call this part of the video watching episode. We're going to go ahead and call this the, uh, taking it to the face or balls to the chin edition of ladies videos. I'm not being gross. I'm being literal. So you can't get mad at me for that. Start off with the first one. This poor girl went to the gym. It might be the first and last time she's going to do it because she took a ball to the chin for sure. Get my workout in and I'm concussed. Yeah, I mean, that was just one more time. Poor thing. Clearly still learning how that ball works. Kapow. I thought that was her eyeball that fell out. Turned out it was just her headphones or her pods there. I was like, did she have a glass eye? Did that poor thing just knock her damn eye out? I don't know. I do know that she's probably not going to try that exercise again. Or at least maybe calm down or get a heavier ball or something. Because kapow. So that's first balls to the face as we do the ladies edition here. Second one I got for balls to the face is an actual sport handball, apparently. Or some sort of handball lacrosse looking thing here and some goalie girl and i don't know who this is and i don't know where this came from i just found it on the internet and i found it funny took a, an extreme facial and i will show you just now this goalie ow yeah oh now immortalized by whoever did that so i don't know who that is where that's from i know it's apparently france and Denmark were playing in some foreign weird thing, and that poor girl's going to need all sorts of rhinoplasty because this is just kabaya. Say about my man, boom. Did you say about my mama, die. So that had to hurt. This next one, I don't know where this came from, and I really need someone to track them down and tell me just what on God's green earth are they talking about? Because I am, I'm, I'm interested. I'm fascinated. I need to know. I don't know what this girl was talking about. I don't know what game this is at. I, I think she's discussing water bottles, I think. But something went to her face, to her chin, and everything else. Check this out. Some game somewhere. Twist the water bottle. Drink the water bottle. What is she talking about? I, I mean, her friend knows. Can someone track these two down? I need to know what they're discussing currently. They're at some game. Twisting. And then it did the... I'm, I'm making the same face as the friend. I'm like, wow, did it? Did it go all the way to the... Really need to know what she's talking about. Go away, Baton. Yeah. So, one more time. I, I put them all together. So, this is, again, the ladies taking it on the chin edition. And it was highlighted, of course, by the first girl at the gym. Then it went on to whatever that was. So, ladies, got to love you. Shout out to you guys. Here is the full... Oh, do I have it? Here we go. Got to love the ladies. Facials can hurt. Life can get rough, patriarchy and all. Appreciate your efforts. Shout out WNBA Finals starting soon. Working hard out there doing your thing in a cold, cold world where cold water apparently will slowly go down your chest and make your friend go, hmm. What else do I got? Oh, speaking of lovey-dovey and God knows what, um... I don't have a reason to play this other than I find it funny. So I'm sure somewhere there's uh, some sort of tie-in with monkey or something, jungle. I could make some sort of thing. I, look, it's my show, and I want to. I just want to play this. I think monkeys are hilarious. I don't think enough people really give enough credence to the idea that we are 99% DNA with the chimpanzee, that, I mean, there is a good chance that that is actually what happened to whoever caused it, your own argument. I don't want to get into all that. But monkeys are so human-like and realistic sometimes. It's fascinating. And then other times, they are straight out of the damn jungle, and they are absolutely wild animals. They can do both. They're, they're a dichotomy. So I'm just playing this because I find it hilarious. So this is exactly what I'm talking about from monkeys being just as cute as can be and then going to back to being absolute wild animals. So here we go. 
Oh, take a picture with us at the monkey at the zoo. Oh, isn't this sweet? I can't wait to show my mom this picture and get out of my way. Ah, <laughs> uh, get a picture of that. You guys, you guys get that? You guys, you guys got zoom in on this. Oh, just a family, cute monkey eating the snacks. Then the next guy showed up. I got your snacks. Got your snacks right here, baby. Mm. Take that. Take that. Take that. <laughs> cute, human-like to wild animals, and some of us are just as wild. Let's face it. I, I you know, some of y'all got stories that probably aren't far away from this to be keeping it a hundred, as the kids say. I just love the just again. This just started off so sweet. I'll give you sweet. I'll give it to you real sweet. Mm. <laughs> uh, we're not that far away, folks. We're not that far away from the jungle ourselves. Monkeys humping at the zoo. Get a picture of that. Ah, uh, yeah. This guy coming up next might not be a monkey, but he's acting sure enough like a ape or a dumbass or a crow magnet of some type. I don't know, again, where this is from. It's a golf course somewhere. They're arguing about, I guess he took a girl's ball. Uh, you know, rather than just replace the ball, they decided to have a fight about it. And this guy went crow magnon And as the people on the video said, might be mentally ill. I don't know. I just think it's funny. So we're going to play that right now. So once again, golf course somewhere. They're arguing about whose ball it is or whatever. And then this crazy Karen man just goes absolutely apeshit. Here we go. We got a Karen on the golf course right now. There he is. Yeah. I'm going to take your clubs. I'm going to take your... Poking him. All this over a golf ball lets me know they both kind of suck, to be honest. You took her ball! You took her ball! Bro, you took her ball. Just wait for it. It's coming. If you need money for a golf ball... Sound like teenagers. Walter. Walter. Oh, here we go. <laughs> See that? Oh. There's a lot there because yes, sir, doing some I love how much he's upset about the mentally ill comment, but you did rip your shirt off and you're not exactly Arnold and you just went ah in front of some people there but uh also just yeah the um just the the farmer's tan the, the way this suddenly group of ballsy teenagers went just hauling ass away there's just a lot to break down here at the end so i mean sure. just one more time oh, this is they do say if you're in a situation where people are starting to try to intimidate or scare you act crazy a group even on a one will always run away from crazy and that's exactly what happened here let's be honest because this guy clearly is upset if you're not mentally ill I can do 100 push ups in 20 minutes. This is my golf ball. I drive a Dodge Stratus. It is hard doing something. So that's cute. Um, what else did I have that was fun? Oh, these are actually cute. Okay, so there is there is crying in baseball and go Philadelphia. It's the two ways I'm going to lead with this. Are you crying? A little There's no segment. crying. There's no crying in baseball. All right, so in case you don't remember, a few weeks ago, or if you don't follow the podcast like you should and whatever, I'll, we'll get to that later. Um, there was a guy named Wes Wilson, and this was a very cool story. So Wes Wilson, in case you missed it, is a guy who had been toiling in the minor leagues for seven years and, you know, almost didn't make it and had all these things happen to him and then was able to finally get his at-bat. And in his very first at-bat as a Philadelphia Philly with his dad in the crowd was able to hit a home run. And it was absolutely tear-jerking, amazing stuff. I got it here somewhere, yes. So this was the first one. Absolutely beautiful to watch. And I'll Wes 
Wilson just picked up right where he left off in the minor So cool. Leagues. Again, had to struggle the for years. 28, first at bat. Just lifted his family high in the air. Everything coming together. Just one of those moments where it's just like, how do you not love this? Then when we cut to dad here, watch this. That smile will be plastered on his face. Look at, the, look at his father. i got to tell you, it, that's emotional. That's awesome. That was awesome. That was an awesome clip. It happened again. I only show you that because it happened again. A proud dad moment like this happened again, and it happened in Philadelphia again. City of brotherly love my ass. This is the city of dad and son love. And what is more awesome for any father than to see their son play Major League Baseball? I mean, that's like every dad's dream. It's not just have a great kid, but to have a great kid make the Major Leagues and have a successful, unbelievable moment. It didn't just happen to Wes Wilson. Now it happened to another guy. His name is Orion Kirkering, and his dad was also in the crowd. He just had his first debut as a Philadelphia Phillies pitcher, and he had his own unbelievable moment with his dad crying. I don't know what's going on in Philly, but apparently there's crying in baseball. It's absolutely beautiful to watch and I will show it to you here in just one second. Ryan hunting for his first big league strikeout and he gets it as he fans Beatty with the slider two down. Look at that. By the way, just so you know, that guy's name is Todd Kirkering. Todd Kirkering is not just his proud father. Todd Kirkering is also someone who spent 20 years in the Marine Corps as a sniper and a recon Marine and has seen all sorts of stuff and did God knows what and sacrificed for this country and did everything he could. And to see his son have his first strikeout in his Major League debut, it was absolutely just beautiful to watch, and I'll show it to you one more time. Ryan hunting for his first big league strikeout. And he gets it as he fans Beatty with the slider two down. It's cool, man. It's good stuff. Richard Orion Kirkland. Mm. First time as a major league pitcher. That's the action. 20 years of service, dad in the audience. Tough guy, can't even hold it back. Can't hold it back. Steven Max's grandfather that, that I've ever seen. It's uh, it's something. Man. Had a couple strikeouts, played great, but Very just again. From Jersey Shore to Reading to Lehigh Valley to tonight in the big leagues for Ryan Kirker. 0 2 coming. And he struck him out with a slide. Kirkering begins his big league career. Dad right there. Dad right there. I don't know how you don't love that. There's clearly crying in baseball, and I'm all for it. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. 20 years of service, going through all sorts of stuff. His kid, again, in a six-month journey, goes from Florida State to the majors. He's able to see it, be right there for it. There was He's part of some sort of emergency thing. There was a hurricane that happened. He didn't even know he was going to be able to make the game. Now that he make the game, he gets to have that moment forever immortalized on television and by me and everyone else who's doing it. So, I mean, the Kirkerings, along with the Wilsons, along with Philadelphia, you know, it's beautiful. I, I love this stuff. You, you will never get me to not stop showing these clips because, what what I mean, how amazing is that? Father-son moments. People just getting their time and their, there's their little, you know, blink in the universe to where everybody gets to see and, you know, realize a dream. If that doesn't catch you here, I don't know what to tell you. If that doesn't make you tear up a little bit, I don't know what to tell you. You're a soulless SOB and I don't really want to talk to you anymore. Good stuff. Go Ryan Kirkery. Go Phillies. Go fathers and sons. I got to go. Love you. Bye-bye.